One of the hostages released by Hamas terrorists has spoken of the hell she experienced during her abduction and she described this huge spider's web of wet tunnels in Gaza that she was taken into. This is 85-year-old Jokoved Lipschitz, who was released last night along with 79-year-old Nurit Jitzak. Both of their husbands are still being held with what we believe is more than 200 other hostages. My mum is telling the horrific stories. She's saying that many, many people, a swarm of people, came through the fence. The defence cost two and a half billion shekels and it didn't help even a little bit. My mum is saying that she was taken on the back of a motorbike with her body, uh, with her legs on one side and her head on another side. That she was taken through the ploughed fields with a man in front on one side and a man behind her. And that while she was do being taken, she was hit by uh, sticks by a shabab. Shabab. Yeah, shabab pe people. Until they reach the tunnels. Meanwhile, the British-based families of people killed or taken hostage in the attacks by Hamas on the 7th of October have been speaking of their grief. They've begged for the return of others who are still missing. It was easier to bury our, our loved ones than to go through the anguish that they're going through. And I can't believe I'm saying that. We buried my sister-in-law, Naomi. It took four days to identify what we call the smile of the south of Israel. In Gaza, the desperation continues. Israel's been pressing on with heavy bombing of the area. The health ministry say at least 5,700 people have been killed, more than 700 of those in the past 24 hours. Well, we can go live to the West Bank now. We can speak to the journalist, Gareth Brown. Gareth, good afternoon. We're obviously learning the horrific details of the situation that some of these hostages have been kept in. What have we learnt? Well, I think just a glimmer of what's really going on. I mean, um, you know, we we had an idea of the kind of horrific experience that some of these these captives had gone through on October the 7th when they were initially captured. And we sort of knew the circumstances, the general circumstances in which they were being held. We knew Hamas had taken over 200 and, and we knew broke most likely that they were holding them in this kind of network of tunnels um, beneath Gaza. But the fact is, you know, for... Four people have been released so far. There's more than, you know, perhaps as many as 220 still being held in the Gaza Strip. Um, and it's believed some of those have died. Hamas says 20 or so of those have died during um, Israeli airstrikes. So, yeah, it's it's a glimpse, but but there's, there's just so much we don't know about these hostages, where they are. Um, that it's hard to draw any kind of significant conclusions from, from, from these kind of cases. Do we know what happened to secure the release of what's now been four people who've been taken? I think these were two separate um, deals, let's say. Uh, we know that there was mediation from, from Qatar and Egypt. Um, my understanding is that it was linked to uh, the first release of the first two Two people was linked to you know a small amount of aid becoming being allowed into Gaza. Seems something similar happened um, with the second release. These two women who were who were released last night. Um, but now the talk is of something more substantial, something bigger. There have been rumours swirling around here that the Red Cross is involved in uh, you know negotiations to release as many as 50, 50 foreign nationals. Now, uh, Hamas are not just going to release 50 foreign nationals. That goes way beyond any sort of, um, you know, gesture on their part. They want something in return for that. And it seems that the thing that they want most at the minute is fuel. Um, that's something that they're really short on and Gaza is, is really short on. So if we're, if we're trying to, um, you know, look forwards, throw this forwards and, and identify what a deal in the coming days might look like to release, you know, a far more substantial number of the hostages, then it could be something like that. We were hearing yesterday, Gareth, that the US in particular, they've said, look, we're really supportive of Israel and their actions, but please could you delay a ground invasion until we can better try and get a handle on where these hostages are and release more of them. 
How crucial is the status of those hostages in determining what happens next from a military perspective in terms of Israel's next actions? That's a really good question. And I think I think it's definitely an element. You know, there, there's no doubt that this ground invasion of, of Gaza has been slowed down. And I think that's a combination both of external pressure, international pressure, but also domestic pressure. So we have the US playing this role, not just the US, but European countries. You know, there are there are British nationals being held in Gaza too. And they are urging the Israeli government, the Israeli military, to really put these hostages at the forefront of their military planning. Uh, now, that cuts through with some parts of the Israeli security establishment and the military, and it doesn't cut through with other parts. Um, the, the thing I would say is that I think as every day goes on, the domestic pressure within Israel is really growing. Um, you know, the families of those who've been killed, who've been held, they're organizing and they're starting to put this pressure on the Israeli government. And so if we go back a week, a week and a half, even two weeks, you know, those few days after the, the Hamas attack on October the 7th, I think there was this sentiment that Israel was, it was really a feeling that Israel was going to crack on, was going to plow on with this mission, and that the hostages were not, um, you know, a priority. And every day that goes past, the, the international pressure to do something, to come to some sort of deal, or figure out a way to get these hostages released, to get them to freedom and safety, it grows. But it also grows on a domestic level in, you know, in the Israeli political system. And I, and I think that that's something that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu can't, can't, can't ignore now. He, he has to listen to the families of those who have been, been kidnapped and killed. And that's, that's a crucial element in, in when this ground invasion of Gaza is going to unroll. Uh, yeah, that's unfold. so interesting because, you know, we've been saying for days that this ground invasion is imminent. What that actually means in terms of a, a time frame, obviously, has been shifting with each day. What clearly is critical now is the situation inside Gaza. And we're hearing from some UN bodies who are saying without fuel, as you already sort of talked about, Gareth, the situation is actually almost impossible to continue, continue operating. You know, how serious a situation are we in then? Yeah, it's dire. It's a catastrophe. It's it's beyond a crisis. It's um, you know thousands of as as you said earlier, five thousand seven hundred people have been killed. Many many of those are children. Infrastructure has been damaged. Houses have been damaged. Hospitals are themselves on life support. Um, and it's I, I also think we're only seeing a tiny fraction of what's going on in Gaza. I mean, I spoke to, spoke to a doctor. Um, in Al Shifa Hospital, which is the largest one in Gaza, a couple of days ago, and he he described how essentially bodies are piling up. People can't get to the cemeteries to bury their their loved ones, and mm. you know you have the risk of things like you know typhus, these these diseases which we associate with kind of um, bygone eras. But but you know the the infrastructure has been devastated. The internet is very bad, and you know there's really very little in terms of foreign media um, allowed into Gaza at the minute. Um, there's, there's simply no access for the media. So as, as bad as we think it might be, it's an awful lot worse because we just can't get information out, let alone get aid, fuel, medical supplies in. Yeah, fuel seems to be the, the really critical one at this point. How likely is it that there'll be a relinquishing from Israel to say, OK, we, we will provide fuel to Gaza? I mean, these talks are uh, really sensitive and, and I think nobody knows really what's going on except those who are directly involved. I, I would say that I think it would be a disaster for everyone if we start to see um, the big hospitals going offline uh, because of a lack of fuel. It's going to be a disaster for, 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 the, for the people in those hospitals, for the Palestinians being treated, for the Palestinian doctors and nurses, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. It, I think it would be a disaster for the international community to allow that to happen. I think it would be a disaster for Israel too. So, I mean, I'm obviously not involved in these talks, but from my perspective, it seems in everyone's interest to find a way to, to get some fuel in. Obviously, the big Israeli concern is that some of this fuel is going to be, um, you know, siphoned off or, or taken by Hamas. But, you know, there are, there are organizations like the United Nations who have a not insignificant footprint in Gaza and there are mechanisms in place to make sure that doesn't happen. And I suspect it's going to happen in the next 24 to 48 hours. OK, it might not be all 50. It might be a smaller amount. Um, but it, 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 it seems that it's in everyone's interest not to, 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 to come to a deal, you know, at least in, in the short term on you know, getting some fuel in, in, in exchange for the freedom of, of some hostages.
Gareth, thank you so much. Uh, Gareth Brown speaking to us there uh, from the West Bank. We can...